่ได้รับเกียรติให้มาเป็นผู้ดําเนินรายการสําหรับการประชุมวิชาการครั้งนี้ในตอนเช้านะครับก็เป็นสิ่งที่น่ายินดีมากนะครับที่เราได้มาพบเจอกันแล้วก็ชุมนุมกันในวันนี้ว่าเป็นงานแสดงเทคโนโลยีทางวิศวกรรมปฏิพีครั้งแรกของประเทศไทยและหวังว่าจะมีครั้งต่อไปในปีถัดไปนะครับ <coughs> ผมเห็นว่าหวังว่าโอกาสลักษณะนี้จะเป็นโอกาสดีที่เราได้มาพบเจอกันเพื่อที่จะนำพาให้วิศวกรรมปฏิพีของไทยเนี่ยจเจริญรุ่งเรืองยิ่งยิ่งขึ้นทัดเทียมอารยประเทศนะครับก็ก็ก็หวังว่าจะเป็นอย่างนั้นนะครับสำหรับกำหนดการในตอนเช้าเนี่ยเราจะเริ่มด้วยคีย์โน้ตสปิเกอร์นะครับซึ่งวันนี้เราได้รับเกียรติจากมิสเตอร์เจมส์ซีจากบริษัทโอวีอาร์บฮ่องกงนะครับท่านจะมาพูดเกี่ยวกับเรื่องอการออกแบบแล้วก็การก่อสร้างการขุดดินลึกในเกาะฮ่องกงนะครับ <coughs> ประวัติย่อๆของคีย์โน้ตสปิเกอร์ของเราเนี่ยจบการศึกษาทั้งระดับปริญญาตรีและก็ปริญญาโทจากแหวเลยฮ่องกงจากนั้นก็เริ่มทำงานที่บริษัทอารุปตั้งแต่ปี1995นะครับแล้วก็ทำเรื่อยมาจนกระทั่งปัจจุบันเนี่ยเป็นดีเรกเตอร์ของของอารุปที่ฮ่องกงซึ่งมีสตาฟมากกว่า 2,300 คนนะครับเป็นบริษัทใหญ่มากนะแล้วก็คีย์โน้ตสปิเกอร์ของเราเนี่ยก็ยังเป็นเฟลโลของฮ่องกงอินสติวอฟเอนจิเนียร์นะครับคุณเจมส์ซีเนี่ยมีประสบการณ์อย่างมากมายจริงๆในงานเกี่ยวกับ <coughs> การขุดดินลึกในหลายๆที่ไม่ว่าจะเป็นฮ่องกงแล้วก็ในเอเชียตะวันออกเฉียงใต้นะครับ <coughs> เดี๋ยวผมจะขอบรรยายอีกสักนิดหนึ่งเป็นภาษาอังกฤษก็กันนะครับเป็นการแนะนำคีย์โน้ตสปิเกอร์ของเรา uh, Ladies and gentlemen it is my great pleasure to welcome our guest speaker for uh, this morning Uh, Mr. James C from OV Arup, uh, Hong Kong. Uh, James got his bachelor and master from uh, the University of Hong Kong, and then after that, start working with Arup. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, from now on, uh, from from that point on, uh, he has been with uh, Arup, and then he is now the director of Arup Hong Kong, which has more than 2,300 staff members. Okay. James is also a fellow of Hong Kong Institute of Engineer. He also practices in uh, several countries around the world, including Hong Kong, Thailand, South Korea, and uh, uh, Vietnam. Uh, with that brief introduction, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker for this morning, Mr. James C. Thank you. I apologize for keeping you waiting because uh, the safe in my room cannot be open. So I, I keep my computer inside the safe. <laughs> it's too safe anyway. So it's glad to be here. And uh, I worked in Bangkok around 20 years ago, actually. I worked several months in Bangkok for a project that they never go, they never complete. That was uh, the uh, Hopewell project. <laughs> All right, so it's my pleasure here to share with you some um, uh, design and construction aspects of the deep excavation works in Hong Kong. And that might be slightly different from you, what you are doing every day in, in here. So I hope you enjoy. So I divide the um, presentation in several parts, and it's quite, quite long, I mean, in terms of the number of slides, but I will try to show more photos rather than, than many works, OK? And so first of all, I would like to introduce a bit of the Hong Kong Institution of Engineers. Hong Kong is very small, right? But we do have a lot of engineers because of special kind of nature of the ground, natural nature of the constraint, etc. So the Engineering Society was established in 1947, and then the Hong Kong IE in law was established in 1975. And currently, we have over 22,000 members. Okay. And we have 19 divisions, so including structural, C4, geotechnical, etc., etc. And in terms of the geotechnical group, so the group was formed in 1980, actually quite early. It's related to the first railway development in Hong Kong. And thereafter, the geotechnical division was formed in 1987. So far, we have more than 4,000 members in geotechnical division, including around 200 fellows, and then 
3,000 corporate members. The remainings are mainly graduate members and a few student members. All right, so I've mentioned about Hong Kong, very small. I mean, Hong Kong currently is only around 1,100 kilometer kind of like square. And compared to Bangkok City, it's only 70% of the Bangkok City. And then only 14% in terms of area of the metropolitan of Bangkok. So it's tiny dot in the world. And the most kind of like problematic in Hong Kong is kind of like hilly terrain. So a lot of hills, mountains. So in terms of the country part, okay, in the hillside, we don't usually develop. They still remain green okay, over the territory, a lot of green places. So we don't have development over those areas. They are protected, actually. In law, we cannot develop. Okay? So the developable area is less than 50%. You can imagine, in Hong Kong, we have more than 7 million people. Okay? Compared to the Bangkok city itself, relatively similar, actually. Bangkok city, I look through, is around 8 million people in the central Bangkok. So similar, but we have only less than half of the space, so very tight. Okay? And every year, we, every year, we receive more than 50 million visitors. Okay? They travel in, travel out. So a lot of people we need to accommodate. So given all this kind of like factual data, so many developments need to go underground. Right? So at the moment, we have kind of like railway systems in the gray line. You see this gray line? And then, currently, we are building the new kind of like lines, like the red lines, green lines, okay? They have different names, but these are the new kind of like railway development, and they are all underground, all right? So, major infrastructure, we push it underground, road tunnels push underground, and also some storm drain tunnels, like the Malaysian one, we also go underground. And in terms of the building projects, and every year, because Hong Kong is very small, right? So the government released the land bit by bit every year. So only, not very big, only 33 hectares per year. Small place, but they are kind of like divided into different size around the territory. So many sites actually from these 33 hectares. And then government also promote public housing. So that's around another 40 hectares. And they're also regenerating the new developments from the old districts, like the low-rise house. They knock it down and then build the high-rise ones. So altogether, perhaps roughly, it's about 80 hectares per year. And for these new developments, most of them will contain underground space. For example, like for the car park, for the palm rooms, and some in the busy districts, they are for commercial usage, okay, for retails, for example. So all these require underground construction. So in my paper, I showed you some common type of excavation works in Hong Kong. So I think the most common one may be also here for the shallow excavation, maybe ship power, steel ship power. Hong Kong, we use a lot of steel. I mean, for temporary works, they all go with steel. So ship power have a beauty of the strength compared to the steel ratio, the weight ratio is very high. So you get very high strength with very little material. So, and also it has kind of like function of reasonable seepage cutoff. So for example, this development, it is nearby the seafront, okay? Nearby the seafront and use the ship power and, and even with sandy material, it provides reasonable seepage cutoff. So you don't need other measures of to stop the water flowing in. The water table in the waterfront is very high, you know that. And so they normally drive in by hammer, okay, pitch by small hammer or by the vibrator. And in more recent years, this kind of like silent piler, as invented by jet pinnies, is more popular, in particular for infrastructure in urban areas. So they cause little vibration, okay? And what it uses is it utilizes the reaction from the early installed ship power. So they have clamps, there's some several legs, okay? Several pair of legs that can claim against the installed ship power, like this one, and then to provide the reaction to press the upcoming ship power into the ground. So it has beauty of, it can be installed in narrow kind of light sites. Also, it's very static, okay? It just press in, press in, okay? It doesn't require any vibratory or hammering action. So this becomes more popular now in Hong Kong for major infrastructures in urban area. For example, this kind of light site is next to the old buildings in busy districts, okay? 
And because of the ground condition, I think the steel paper wall perhaps is another very popular kind of like uh, system in Hong Kong. What is it? It's actually a circular hollow section of steel. Okay, it kind of like bring down by a drill bit, kind of like eccentric drilling. Okay, so the hole actually forms slightly bigger than the casing, and then the drill bit will bring the casing down. So this has a beauty of overcoming the obstructions, like the core stones, like the like the boulders in the field and in the in situ material. So, so this is particularly useful in the kind of like hilly terrain area, and in the kind of like uh, seafront area, they do need to have some ground curtains behind the wall in order to stop water coming in. Right? So. Sometimes it causes some problem because they actually form a hole bigger than the casing and they use the high pressure air to flush the material. So sometimes it causes kind of like subsidence okay, in the, with the old techniques in terms of the uh, 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 during process. So nowadays we use more advanced technique like the uh, ring bit. So you have, apart from the, from the drill bit itself, the ring also, also help to drill. Okay? So the ring is attached to the casing, okay? So it has the ability to drink, to, to drill down as well. So this kind of ring bit system, okay? So it's more popular now. So it causes less disturbance to the ground. And soldier power is a variation of the former wall, actually. We install, the typical technique, actually, we install the steel casing. And then after that, we insert the X session, and then we withdraw the kind of like the temporary casing. So the, the construction technique, in fact, is very similar for so soldier power wall and the kind of light power wall. And you may be more familiar with ball power wall, actually. Ball power wall and also diving wall. So in Hong Kong, we don't kind of like, it's not very common to use ball power walls nowadays because of the construction technique I, I'm going to tell you slightly later. So in some cases, we may use second power wall, so overlapped, basically. Overlap the primary power together with the secondary power. And it ha has the ability to form an arching effect, okay? So this kind of wall, for example, like the left-hand side, this actually is a circular shaft. A shaft go to very deep, around 16 meters, in order to go down to the cave in order to build the railway. So roughly it's about 25 meters in diameter. So it's formed by bigger kind of like primary power and then smaller kind of like secondary power and then form a circular cover dam. So you don't actually need any lateral support in this kind of cover dam. So Occasionally, we may use this, or we may have some uh, contiguous ball power wall, so isolated, and then you may have ties or struts to support the wall. Uh, but of course, if the groundwater table is high, then we do need to have some other means to stop the water coming in. For example, light. In this photo, you may see it's really, really red, right, down there. Actually, the water is leaking. So this wall is not the ideal one, actually. And construction of the ball piles, I mean, in, in, in Thailand or in other coastal areas, it's more common to use this calibar technique, right? And because of the soft material. So use the calibar mount buckets, you can kind of like excavate the material, and then use the bentonite to support the kind of like the power ball or polymer to support the power ball. But this kind of technique it is seldomly used in Hong Kong unless this particular site that with good ground condition. In many cases in Hong Kong, we have kind of like non-uniform field. So you have boulders, you have different material in the field. You then come into alluvium or marine deposit and then they decompose granite or tuff. And there are lots of core stones down there. Okay? So in the more common, like common technique actually, the, excuse me. So the technique actually, we use the full length casing. So all along the ball power, we use the casing. And then we use the water as the kind of the fashion medium, and then breath through the soil. And when it comes to the obstruction, we use the reverse circulation drill, okay, drill through the obstruction, and then sink the casing again, all the way to the formation level, the funding level. So this kind of technique actually is very really safe because you use the full length casing to support the power because of the ground is not homogeneous. So it actually if it falls, the boulders would drop into the power ball and the power becomes bigger and bigger, right? So, so to prevent the collapse, we use full length casing. And then after you insert the reinforcement concreting and then we extract the, the temporary casing. So 
this kind of light construction te technique is very safe, but it's time consuming. For example, in here, if you build a 16 meter ball power, you may take only one shift, maybe 12 hour, at most maybe 18 hours in, in here. But in Hong Kong, if you build this same dimensional power, it may take roughly about five days. So it's very really time consuming. So that's why the ball power wall is not very really common used as the, the retaining wall because you have very really large number of quantity, right? For the dive frame wall, and also you are familiar with, with dive frame wall as well because you have lots of MLTA development nowadays. And it's a linear kind of light feature, linear uh, aligned kind of light panels. So typical thickness in Hong Kong similar is uh, 800 mm to 1.5 meter, okay? So the panel length on plant is 2.8, minimum is 2.8, up to around seven meters, okay? And so the construction technique, I think, is similar, both in here, in Hong Kong. We use scrap to start with, but because of the material, in some occasions, it's very hard. So we may use the trench cutter in that case, so that has better ability to overcome harder material than the, the wheat soil, okay? So now comes to the support. So we talk about the wall, uh, how about the lateral support? So for infrastructures, it's very common to use this type of, we call braced support. So from this wall support to that wall, okay, self support within the site. And for example, this is a railway station, roughly about 300 meters and by kind of like 25 meter wide. So that gives you very kind of like regular pattern of the structs, right? And then you don't really affect the land outside. So this is very common in Hong Kong. And also in the urban area, we cannot have any support outside the sites because next door is already the building nearby, right? So this is almost like the default, you can say default supporting system in Hong Kong. And in some occasions, we may be able to use anchors, okay? But only few sites, for example, like if we can get the land, okay, for temporary use or permanent use. So some anchors are actually retrievable. You install the anchor, and then you can retrieve the strands afterwards, okay? So they only leave the anchor body in that kind of like segment in, in the ground left in there. But after all, this, the cable strands can be pulled out after. So, so we have few kind of light sites use this kind of light technique, but not common, actually. And top-down construction in Bangkok also for some railway stations, they also go for top-down. So we, you use the slab because they need to be built anyway in the long term. So you use the slab as the lateral support, okay, with some steel stanchions to support vertical kind of like the, the low from the slabs or from the superstructure, and then you excavate downwards, okay. So, so this has kind of like beauty of minimizing the use of temperature shots, all right. And one variation uh, in previous slide I've demonstrated about the circular coffer dam using ball power wall. Actually, more common is to use dive and wall. So for example, like this coffer dam, it's for the ICC, the highest, tallest tower in Hong Kong. It's 76 diameter, 76. And we use the dive and wall to insetment such that they can form a circle. So it utilizes the kind of like the hook action to, su to support the wall itself, like a drum, okay? And so actually you don't need any kind of like structs internally, okay? These ring beams actually, they are more for, for, for to comfort the government official, okay? I can say that. In reality, if you do an analysis, these ring beams has no real function actually. They are too weak compared to the wall itself, okay? To make them more comfortable, usually we have maybe have one or two ring beams inside. So um, also you can see from this photo, these are the barracks actually, barracks foundation for this uh, uh, highest tower in Hong Kong. And now comes to the design aspect. Okay, so the design practice in Hong Kong um, for such a works, we all go into limit state design. Okay, so we check for the uh, serviceability limit state. We also check for the ultimate limit state. But for the geotechnical design in Hong Kong, still we are following the working, working stress approach. So we do analysis for the working stress condition, and then we use a low factor to factor up the results in order to get the force for the design, okay? So these are very old publications, but still we are following this code, like the GeoGuide one. 
Geo guide one is guide to the retaining wall design, and we get some parameters from this publication. And then this this publication is all, um, only guideline in Hong Kong that actually provide some uh, uh, design requirement and and code requirement, something like that. And it's very old. It was published in 1990, so 24 years ago already. So I assume they will update soon. And more recently, um, not recent actually, this was published in early 2000, right? But in Hong Kong, we only adopt this kind of like code uh, uh, in recent years. So this has entered into limit state design age, okay? So the serial report was published in the UK, okay? So it used the concept of limit state design. And now it kind of like in conjunction with the Euroco. So Euroco, all Euroco are limit state, okay? So this is a change of the design practice from the working stress approach to limit stage approach. Unlike Bangkok, Bangkok you have substantial water drawdown, right? Because of the historical use of water. So the poor water pressure actually drops at lower upper sand or lower sand area. But in Hong Kong, we are under hydrostatic condition. So in that case, you can imagine in the seafront, the water table is just about two meters below, below the ground level. So in typical ground condition, the ground water okay, in Hong Kong actually dictate the design of the excavation works. So because it, it kind of like contribute more than 70% of the force. So the soil kind of like low, only small portion of the low, but water is dominating. And there are a few kind of less stabilities we normally check. One is the toe stability, of course, toe kick, okay? Because there are two issues. One is about the ultimate limit state, whether it fails, okay? Whether it will fail. Second is whether it will move a lot, okay? So such that it may affect the adjacent rows and the adjacent buildings. So the factor safety apply actually is quite high. We are talking about on passive, we are applying factor safety of two, okay? Compared to other cities, it, this is a big kind of life value actually. In particular, in clay, you can never achieve this fact of safety. And also, I talk about water. So hydraulic failure is another critical factor because no matter is uh, alluvium, CDG, okay, the, the, the composed granite, they are all relatively permeable. They are not clay. So the hydraulic failure is another critical case that we need to check. And in this case, we check for 1.5. 1 so, in terms of the software, so I think nowadays no people will do hand calculation, right? So they all go with computer. And this is a kind of like a boundary element method. It's not final element, it's kind of like pseudo final element method, you can say. And flu actually is quite popular in Hong Kong and elsewhere. It was developed by uh, Oasis, that's part of the Arab actually. And it's very quick to run, actually, you can. Uh, simulate different stages of excavation. So compared to structural design, staged kind of like simulation is very important because the lot in force under every stage, okay, that will accumulate to a big force compared to the, to the structural design. So total different concept. And uh, nowadays, I think many people, I mean, go for final element, okay? So this actually has a beauty of very quick to run. So the initial design check, we may use this software. And then after that, if we, we need to go into more kind of like accurate, you can say accurate kind of like estimation of the ground movement outside, and then what's the effect to surrounding, then we may go into a final element. Like I think some of you may be aware of Plexus, for example. And then we have other software like Safe or, or kind of like uh, uh, Flat, for example. So, so this kind of like software, the beauty is able to give you the deformation outside the the retaining wall, such that you can estimate the effect to the surrounding ground, to the surrounding structures, etc. And in, in some occasions, we do need to have some three-dimensional analysis, okay? In, in, in kind of like some PhD kind of like uh, students, they may be very keen in developing kind of like 3D techniques, like the MIDAS or Presses or whatsoever kind of like Abacus kind of like uh, software. And I think in Hong Kong, for commercial use, we don't usually go into 3D analysis. First of all, programs in Hong Kong, they do need to be approved by the government. So such system is very complicated because you need to validate your software before you can use it. So imagine, how can you verify a 3D analysis? 
you need to use another software to verify it, right? So it's kind of like entering into a very complicated kind of like situation. And, and, and so in most kind of like cases, we use 2D analysis, and in some occasions, we may force to use 3D analysis. So I talk about, briefly talk about the limit states design approach in this C580 approach, so published by Zero Report uh, in the UK. So we have our own parcel factors, okay? In Hong Kong, we adopt our own parcel factors to replace the parcel factors stated in the code, okay? And, and this factors basically is follow the red book I showed earlier, that's the GeoGuy one. So we factor down the strength, and then we factor up the loads, for example, like surcharge next to your excavation, okay? So that gives you the ultimate limit state. So this enter into this part. So we carry out the ultimate limit state with the partial factors par parameters and then some construction considerations in the excavation as recommended by serial report. And then we got the ultimate limit state forces in the props, in the walls, etc. And also we study the toe-in requirement. So now we are not checking against a factor of safety too. We run the ultimate limit state analysis and then to test to test where the wall should stop before it fails in the finite element analysis or in fluid analysis, okay? In any kind of computer analysis, we test out where should the wall stop and that is the, the requirement that we require, okay? And this is the ultimate limit state and then we also check the SLS, the survival limit state to estimate the ground movement actually, the ground movement or the movement next to your, your building. And, and then the kind of like the SLS forces. And how to decide the members then is to compare this force, okay, from the ultimate limit state with this works will not go wrong, okay, in terms of the structural member design, etc. And of course, compared to the conventional methods, conventional method will only check this, okay? We check the SLS and then use the low factor to calculate the member and then we omit the ultimate limit state, okay? So this one becomes more kind of like uh, robust in terms of the design. And it's increasing trend to be used in the major excavation, okay? So for example, like this one, the beauty is, for example, if we have a toe-in, for example, like this ship power wall, we have excavation of minus six, that is 11 meters below ground, and then the toe actually go to another 10 meters below the final formation level in kind of like sandy material here. So we test, okay, in the ultimate space limit state, we test the toe in from 10 meters to nine to six to five. Actually, the, it's still stable until it raise around four meters, okay? If you raise going up, then the wall will fail, okay? So we test for the toe, and then we also study the kind of like the bending moment forces, okay? It doesn't change much, okay? So this will give you the where the wall should stop, okay? As the bare minimum, okay? That's the first requirement. Of course, the second requirement is the ground water cutoff because when you raise the toe, the kind of like the path of seepage getting shorter, it may enter into seepage problem, okay? But in the former slide, you can see that in this project, because of the requirement, they have grow curtain anyway at this portion. So if you raise the toe, the grow curtain actually go higher up, okay? So it compensates the, the overcome the seepage problem, okay? So if in this kind of light project, actually we can save on the toe requirement. And remember, this is not just the material because in Hong Kong, as I mentioned, there are lots of obstructions in the ground. So you, if you can drive the power, the, the, the wall shorter, it has a big advantage of you not try to overcome the obstruction in greater depth, okay? So it's program issue and the risk issue actually, yeah, not just the saving the material. So now I briefly uh, describe one project that which is undergoing at the moment. We have a top 3D analysis. This is very complicated. If you go to Hong Kong and then uh, if you need to go to Ocean Park or other places, you may change from the subway to bus, okay? So this is the the station, underground station actually, F five level of basement, and then this kind of like interchange station for two lines. One we call it the Chimuan line, the other one is the island line. So interchange of two lines, 
and then we have a commercial basement already in blue, all in blue color here. Okay, so these are the kind of like the old tunnels formed by compressed air. Okay, compressed air method X squared. So within this area, we need to build another station. Okay, new station. Actually, it's, it's deeper. Okay, occupying the entire space, and then we go underneath the existing station by another two stories. Okay, so the kind of like uh, a brown color. And then, like this, is five level to provide an interchange for another two lights. So totally, there will be four lights in the change at this station. It's the most busiest station in the future. So this station will the line will go into the right red line and then allow for another line to go out in the future. Okay. So the cross section is like this. Okay. It's very deep. So current station or platform is at roughly about minus 18. That is about 22 meters already. And then we need to go for all the way from from the ground to 40 meters, okay? From four to minus 36. So the the kind of little geometry is very tricky, right? Is you have existing structure like this, you have another car park there, you have some some areas we need to stop and then to minimize the on grade. This car park actually is on grade, okay? They don't they are not supported by piles, okay? So we need to carry out some complicated kind of right 3D analysis for, to look at the corner effects. Okay, actually we try to estimate the movement and the forces in more accurate manner. So this kind of light analysis. So this is the bedrock and then we need to actually cut into the rock. So this is the deformation shape, like the deformation of the ground and on the car parts. Behind circular thing is the, the existing tunnels and then the existing platform of the, for that line. Okay, so deformation shapes, the movement extends, for example, the formation extends, and then the stresses, okay? This stresses is related to the stability of the existing platform, actually. We, it's in use, okay? During the time of the construction, it's in use. So this photo, so this is the existing platform, the bottom of the platform, actually. So we, we need to excavate all the way to down to somewhere here, okay? This photo is taken in the uh, last month, actually. So also we need to mine underneath the platform, okay? So we need to support it, underpin, like underpinning the bridge, okay? But th this is an all underground, 20 meters below ground. So we need to underpin the platform and then to excavate underneath it. So we form some pillars, some pillars. We, we left the pillars and then mine through this area in authentic manner, mine through it first and then build a structure and then come back and then break down these pillars and build the remaining section. So the entire station is a very complicated kind of like uh, uh, construction actually. All right, so one distinct requirement actually in Hong Kong compared to other cities may be the size solution requirement, okay? In some countries like, uh, like in China, so the designer produces the design and then so-called an independent concern sup supervisor will supervise the work. But the supervisor may not even know what the design is. See what I mean? It's, it's so-called independent because uh, contractually or, or the kind of like uh, taking the responsibility is independent company. However, that company may not have the knowledge on this kind of like design. So Hong Kong will go into a very different kind of like approach, okay? The designer, himself need to take care of the supervision role, all right? He looked through the construction process, even though the contractor may have their own alternative. Sometimes may, they may produce alternative, but the designer know the site constraint, know the kind of the entire project. So the designer still look through the en entire process. And in mid-90s, uh, Arab and the government look through the, all the case histories because it, by that time, there are lots of kind of like incidents incurred by excavation works. So a lot of failures, okay? So we look at a lot of case histories like the, uh, in the old days we still have case on wall, okay? But nowadays we don't have case on walls. Ship power wall, dive and wall, uh, uh, pet power wall, et cetera. So in total, every year in Hong Kong in early 90s, roughly it's about 100 to 200 cases of excavation works. Some are minor, some are small, some are relatively bigger for public developments mainly. And, and we look through these case histories, and then we found that most failures, they are induced by ship power wall. Okay, the ship power wall, those drive into the ground. 
And then those failures, they are significant. Significant means, I show you the photos later, what do we mean by significant? Because in your term, the significant may not be significant, okay? Different standards. And, and uh, they, they don't actually, okay? They, some go beyond 10 meters, but many cases, half of them are within 10 meters. So 10 meters roughly is for two level basements, okay? And then some, in some cases, there's only one level basement. And the facilities nearby, okay, usually it's low-rise buildings. So that's why you can visualize the, 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 uh, the consequence, okay? Otherwise, if they are high-rise building, if they are supported by piles, then the kind of like the consequence may be very minor in that case. So well, this is what I mean by, by large failure already. In Hong Kong, the definition is almost like if you are affecting public, that they need to close the road, okay, and then they their kind of like chance of a car dropping in the ground because of the incident, they, they classify as large, okay? It doesn't necessarily mean the, a death of people or fatal, fatal kind of like incident, okay? It's kind of a like major disruption to the public, actually. This is one of the cases, like uh, the hole actually occupy half of the, of the link. And then another case in Central, this one is more, more tricky because it's located in financial district, okay? So if you have major disruption, to the kind of like the traffic that will cause trouble, okay? So the depth of the, the collapse is quite deep. We are talking about four or five meters deep. So in, in the conclusion from, from this kind of like study, actually is the workmanship. Workmanship means the site control on site, okay? So either the contractors skip some kind of like length of the power, so they did not drive the wall deep enough, or the control system has has problem, okay, over the entire process. So after that, the government published the supervision code. So the latest revision is 209 supervision. And this document need to read together with another document, okay, they come together. And in that kind of like uh, document, it defines what kind of a material, the construction works we classify as building, building works with significant geotechnical content, okay? And that geotechnical content will need to be supervised by the geotechnical stream of people. Other than that, they are supervised by structural stream, okay? So in the excavation works, like the diving wall, ship power wall, excavations, grouting, so everything needs to be supervised by two streams. One is the structural stream, one is the, the uh, geotechnical stream of people. So I don't bother go through this, but how we identify how many peoples we would need for a particular site, that was measured by the value of the work. So four million is the basic value. For example, if I have a diving wall, the diving wall is eight million of kind of a value, okay? Then this basic value is four million. That means I need two, okay? Two persons to station there to supervise the works, okay? So that's a quite a stringent kind of like requirement, actually. So even the size is small because, I mean, the price index in Hong Kong is very high, right? So you do need a lot of people to supervise the works. So in the organization, it looks like this. From T1 to T3, we call it. And T3 basically is a graduate with two years experience. So junior engineer, you can say. The T3 represents a junior engineer. So these people, they are stationed full-time on site. Okay, and the number of people is calculated based on the period slide. And then the T4, T5, this more representing the professional engineer, like the chartered engineer that uh, uh, may have one or two years, something like that. So these people, they will visit the site on periodic manner. Okay, for example, usually, usually it's weekly kind of manner. So every week, the senior engineer, he needs to visit the site once in order to check whether the design has been implemented on site, okay? And then on top of that is kind of like more senior person, like the uh, registered geotechnical engineer. Currently, I think all together, there's only around 70, 70 uh, LGE in Hong Kong. Roughly, it's about 300 RSEs in Hong Kong, okay? <coughs> so the frequency is like that. So the T3 from here, you can see for, for the highlighted one is five. Five means full time. Okay, so that code apprentice actually gives you the guideline uh, uh, where you should, you should put people in full time. And then four means weekly inspection. And then once means 
if required, the, the, the registered geotechnical engineer will go there to have a look, okay? In some cases, we may go on a monthly basis, okay? Every month we visit the site. And this is the checklist, very really comprehensive, okay? And I don't bother to show you this, okay? You can have a look on the code if, if necessary. All right, I just want to highlight a few key kind of like observations in Hong Kong compared to other cities maybe. So top down in some kind of like projects, we may prefer to do so, but I mean, in this case, uh, it's very congested kind of like working environment, and in effect, it's not very popular. The most popular one is still the bottom-up construction of the basement. So we excavate all the way to the bottom level, and then construct the base lab, and then all the way up. And one particular reason is because in Hong Kong, the land price is very high. So when the owner or the, the, current, the developer get the land, they want to start the construction already. So they will build the wall, and then they, as long as they know what's the depth to go for, they can build the wall, go to the depth, and then what is inside, then they can decide later. They can have bigger footprint and smaller footprint, okay? They can adjust. So the bottom-up construction actually gives the developer more flexible to decide the final building later on. So that's why this is more popular, far lot more popular in Hong Kong. And for the movement limits, I mean, no, I think no people in Hong Kong would like to see some cracks in their buildings or even this very low-rise house, roads, or drying out of their wells, for example. So this is a big news. Even this tiny kind of light crack, it becomes big news in the newspaper, okay? So the government imposed very stringent requirement, okay? We are talking about what does it mean is, for example, like the ground movement for a deep excavation. The ground movement allowed value basically is one inch, okay? One inch came from the very old rule of thumb of kind of like uh, when British kind of like was governing Hong Kong. And nowadays we still use one inch. But in the old days, the excavation is very shallow, right? For one level basement, five meters. Nowadays we are talking about 30 meter excavation, 40 meter excavation, but the rule is still the rule. So it's very changing requirement. So the consequence is we need to, to pump up the stimulus of the wall or other members. Even in infrastructures, so the green zone is what we are looking for. So the maximum value in some areas perhaps is 50 millimeters, okay? This is already better than the building projects for the infrastructure project, but still low, what can I say is. Yes. All right, so this is an example for a new railway station which is under construction now. So um, only single tunnel comes in, that means double tunnel, okay? So one below, one up. So the, the station is very narrow because it need to fit into a narrow street. So it's very deep. We are talking about this depth, 35 meter deep, in order to accommodate two platform levels, okay? And the buildings next door is not very good, okay? So we need to provide a lot of cross walls, actually, with a dive end wall, and then with some cross walls. These are not structs. These are cross walls before you excavate. So very kind of like heavy duty wall, I can say. And after all, still we are talking about maybe might be 50 meter, millimeter uh, uh, settlement, and in some non-critical area, we, we may go for like 60 or 70, but uh, it's very, very kind of like stringent. So that enter into, we need to beef up the wall, okay, very robust wall, and very robust structs. So that's why Yonan structs in Singapore nowadays are quite popular. In Hong Kong, they provide modular structs, heavy members, okay, they can they are prefabricated and then joined by bolts on site, okay? They are very heavy duty. You can compare this guy with this truck, okay? Very large member. And also, the consequences, also we need very heavy pillow, very strong pillow to control the movement, okay? So sometimes the trucks may go to uh, 1,200 ton, okay, per truck. This is a very high pillow we are talking about to control the movement. And one Critical issue, seepage, I mentioned about the ground water table is very high. It come with the sandy material. For example, like this is development uh, near a seafront, okay? This is uh, not our project, another project, okay? Next door, actually. We saw the, the failure. And they almost ready to cast the binding layer, cast the cap in part of the site. And in one weekend, okay? In one weekend, the entire site flood. The excavation from this level to the that level, that's about 13 meters, 13, okay? And then over two days, actually the water depth 
go up entirely. You can't stop, actually. There no way to, there's no way to stop the water coming in because it's next to the seafront. So this kind of like failure, if happens, it's quite kind of like a dangerous situation, right? If you have workers working inside, I mean, there are a lot of plants inside, actually. They all kind of like submerge in, into the, the water. So what happens in this side, we suspect, is because the actual seawall is then maybe wider. So some ship piles actually hit the obstruction, and they have some defect. Okay, later on, the, the water just connects from the sea, very permeable rock field, all the way into the excavation, and there's no way to stop the water from the sea, right? So this kind of like situation, occasionally, is very kind of like uh, 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 critical for the derailments nearby the seaside. And we also have extensively use of the monitoring instruments as well, because the kind of like the distance between the derailment and the next kind of like existing derailments, they are very close. And for the infrastructures, they affect a lot of the urban area. So whole range of the instrumentation we are, we are using. And then for some important projects, we also use the automatic deformation monitoring system. That's the electronic field of light that will kind of like survey the targets, okay, in the defined intervals. And also different instrumentation firms, they provide software to display the kind of like the results in real time manner. And then they also send out SMS. So, so actually I receive many, many SMS every day. So when they reach the action level or whatever level, okay, in the infrastructure projects, of course. <laughs> okay, so I talk about a little bit about the future underground projects. So in Hong Kong, we are lack of flat lands, okay? We are limited by the reclamation. When, you, when we try to reclaim, an uh, environmental group will, will come out and protest, okay? We can't make a lot of reclamation. So we have shortage of land. However, I have showed you, in Hong Kong, we have hilly terrain, there are lots of light the reserve in this area. This reserve not on the surface, but on underground, okay? So this is the initiative that we try to go underground. So in Hong Kong, in the future, several years or 10 years, very likely we will have more facilities that put underground into the hillside, okay? So we are, I mean, Arab is studying the uh, cave kind of like entire strategy for the Hong Kong actually, so where to put and then there will be some pilot sites to be selected and then to turn into a real project in the upcoming few years, right? So this is one of the major initiative. Another initiative is railways will never stop their development, okay? They keep adding kind of like lies into the existing ones, okay? So all these lies mostly they are underground, okay? So in this aspect, we are talking about cave kind of like formation as well. And in urban area, in urban area, in some new developments, we definitely, we need underground uh, 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 space for car park or other usage. And in some areas, like the West Kowloon District, cultural district area, it's big site actually, this is the ICC tower, it's a very big site. What is the concept or the scheme is actually we push all the traffic underground and then lift the ground level, okay? There's no car at all. So people can enjoy the kind of like walk around, okay? So can enjoy the, the area entirely by walking through, okay? If they need traffic, they can go under underground. So this kind of like uh, uh, initiative is coming, okay, in, in Hong Kong. And lastly, I would like to mention about the digital environment. Nowadays, for Building projects, M&E projects, they talk about BIM, okay? B building information management, okay? And in civil projects, geotechnical projects, we also enter into build environment modeling as well. For example, like this project, if you look at this topography, it looks like a villa development over the terrain, right? So nothing very special. If we do a simulation in what does it means in the temporary situation, actually involve almost like 40 meter cut into the hillside in order to build the kind of like uh, uh, basement structures to allow the ramp to go up. So this kind of like uh, site formation works, we call it site formation works, is difficult to realize from 2D drawings, okay? If we put it in 3D, it becomes more, more kind of like easy to understand, okay? So like this one, if we, okay. 
So if we produce this by GIS, okay, you can turn around, have a look at the different formation level. Okay, you see the shadow, this higher level, slope cut, lower level, and then deeper level. And, and the elevation of the wall, toe yin, etc. So, I mean, this kind of like 3D software, they are not very difficult to use, but they are very powerful, okay, in order to allow the designer as well as the client, the most important, the client to visualize what does it look like, okay? They can't actually visualize from the 2D drawings. So this will become another norm. And in very project, I think in, in some of your projects, also you have kind of like visualization by flying through video, Look, looks like this, you have boreholes nearby. You can integrate the existing information into this kind of like 3D model, like the existing piles, supporting the piers, etc. The boreholes, the ground conditions, the terrain above ground as well. And so this one is for another kind of major interchange project. Okay, I go all the way to here. So this one is more tricky, okay? In a 2D drawing, for this kind of a network underground, it's not easy to visualize, okay? So if you turn into kind of like 3D simulation, this will give you a very good idea what does it look like after all, okay? In the kind of like interchange of the two stations. So this kind of like planning tool that help actually for the designer to, to see what is the critical area need to analyze or to look at, okay? So once you produce with the topography, you know where actually the design doesn't work. All right, so this is the station I talked about, this major hill cut there. And this time we don't need to have any vertical wall, okay? We try to do an open cut. We are talking about 50 meter deep excavation, okay, in the hillside. And we use kind of like some fiberglass soil nails, some fiberglass, actually. The fiberglass will allow the power later on for the property development to, to penetrate through, okay? So that's one major uh, advantage. And this is the cut when we look down to the south, okay? And look to the north, okay? So this is the building next door. What does it look like? It, it's quite close to the 3D simulation at the day one, actually. So this is my last slide, actually. So in Hong Kong, I just give you a feel of what are the EOS works look like. So it may be different to a certain extent to your projects in here, but both of us have different challenges, okay? So in Hong Kong, there are lots of challenges, actually, not by the design itself, but design to suit the constraint, to suit the movement limits, etc. That gives you a kind of like headache in order to bring it through. And also we, we have kind of like uh, more advanced techniques to deal with the complicated kind of like constraints as well, like the 3D analysis, like the simulation, et cetera. And, and definitely we, we, we need good engineers that can kind of like appreciate the, the kind of like the constraints and then the appropriate simulation or, or analysis for the complicated EOS as well to ensure the safety. And finally is the quite distinctive kind of light solution control in Hong Kong that also enhance the safety. In, in recent kind of like 10 or 20 years, we seldom aware of any failure. Even though the case of flooding, I, I told you earlier, the wall itself is very stable. Basically, the water coming in, okay, when water coming in, the excavation actually becomes more stable, okay, before you pump the water out. And lastly, yes, one Good thing in Hong Kong is all the design codes I have showed you, they are free to download, okay? You can enter into the site if you type buildings department or you type CEDD, okay? You can go to the website and then there are lots of publications. They are all free to download in PDF version, okay? So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your excellent presentation. So why don't we have a few questions from the floor to the speaker. Keynote speaker for today. Can you ask me in English and in English? If you don't have any questions, please stop here. I'm going to ask you to ask you to ask Dr. Vanchai Thepharak to ask you 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 to ask